are amazing because they can inhabit basically every part of the biosphere displaying such vast diversity of form and function. But whether you're a frog or a hydra or a monkey or a spider, a squid, a bird or a human, you're still constrained by some things. You have to be able to obtain oxygen and nutrients. You have to be able to excrete wastes and respond to stimuli. So this unit, we're going to explore the amazing anatomy and physiology of animals. And so anatomy just means structure, uh, the way the body plan is organized, the pieces of the body, um, and physiology is how those pieces work together and produce function for the animal. So it's going to be really important that you can explain the importance of homeostasis and give some examples in this unit. You're going to be able to describe the various feedback systems that control homeostasis and provide at least one example of positive feedback and one example of negative feedback. We're going to begin just by discussing some of the limitations to animal body plans. Physical laws like gravity and energy demands, all organisms uh, need ATP in order to sustain their life processes, these are going to limit the size and shape of an animal's form. So there are some different body plans that we see in the animal kingdom. Uh, the asymmetrical body plan is something that you'd see in something like a sponge, and it doesn't have any pattern or symmetry at all. Radial symmetry uh, is common in aquatic organisms like the ones that attach to the bottom of boats or grow onto uh, rocky surfaces, and they exhibit radial symmetry, something like a starfish, where it has a definite up and down, but you can't really distinguish between the left and the right. Now, bilateral symmetry is the type that we're probably most familiar with. We see this in most organisms, most animal organisms, where you have a definite left and right, like the hands in a human, or if you're comparing the left and the right side of a shellfish creature. And so what we find is that convergent evolution produces really similar physical features in organisms based on the pressures of the environment. For an example, an aquatic organism has pressure to be able to move with speed and to be able to navigate those waters quickly, um, it reducing drag. And so we find that they tend to have more of a tube-like structure to their body that we call fusiform, uh, where it's tapered at the head and at the caudal region, like that of a shark. Uh, in land-dwelling organisms, you find that gravity is the major pressure that exists in animals. You're not going to find a, a bird with um, really heavy bone structure, or else it won't be able to uh, create enough lift to be able to get off of the ground and fly. Some other limitations in body form is the material that's used to give structure. Arthropods and in, in insects, which vastly outnumber animals. Uh, they have what we call an exoskeleton composed of chitin that grows on the outside of the body and so their body tissues um, extend inwards from that. And so anytime that organism is going to grow it's going to have to produce a larger exoskeleton and then molt off of molt the old one away from the body plan. And so that puts some limitations on, on how big it's going to be able to grow. It also has quite a bit of weight. So if it's producing an ex exoskeleton that's so large that it would be too heavy to move efficiently, then that's going to be a limiting factor for that organism. Uh, endoskeletons are what um, mammal-type organisms have, where you have a calcium carbonate frame inside the body, and the body tissues... Uh, grow outwards from that skeleton. Uh, again, you still have some limitations because if the skeleton is too heavy, that's going to prevent efficient movement. Another limitation is just the ability to move materials in and out of an organism's cells. It's critical that organisms be able to exchange materials with their environment, which is an, an aqueous environment uh, for animals, and whether that be the blood, uh, uh, circulating through our, our body tissues, or it be 
uh, as is the case with a single-celled organism like a paramecium shown in the figure here, uh, and it's directly with the aqueous environment, um, you still have to be able to do that efficiently and move materials in and out. Another factor that limits body plan is the amount of energy that an organism needs. Small animals lose their body heat um, more quickly to the environment. Again, that small body plan is ideal for moving materials in and out efficiently, but you're also going to be losing heat. And so that's a, a concern for organisms that need to regulate body temperature. Active animals have higher energy demands, which puts limitations on their bodily functions as they're going to need to be able to generate enough ATP to sustain them. And so some adaptations that organisms display in response to this sort of thing is called torpor. And torpor is a, just a decrease in activity, um, a decrease in overall metabolism that allows the animal to survive when conditions are less than ideal. And you're certainly familiar with hibernation where you have an extended period of torpor, uh, typically in the winter, where an organism can reduce body temperature, reduce metabolism to su survive those harsh conditions um, when the weather is cold. Uh, estivation you may not be familiar with, but that's a really similar to hibernation. It's just going to be more in the summer months. And so if temperatures are too hot and um, perhaps too dry, then again, organisms can go into a decreased activity, a decreased metabolic state that allows them to survive. So we're going to find that organisms have high levels of uh, correlation between form and function. That's an overriding theme in biology. Form fits function. And uh, we see that there is coordinated control at every level, and this ensures the survival of an organism. And a good example that we can discuss is the endocrine system. The endocrine system has the role of responding to stimuli um, through the release of chemical signals that we call hormones, um, and these get released from specialized gland tissues, the gland being the organ, and then it's composed of uh, secretory tissues. And so these signals travel through the bloodstream, uh, bringing in our circulatory system, so these systems are working together, but then when they reach their target, they're going to reach a specialized cell that has a receptor that um, receives the signal and then initiates a cascade of events to uh, maintain homeostasis for the organism. And so that's looking at the level of the body system, but even just the body plan itself, we'll find that form fits function. Uh, the Arctic fox is a great example. Um, our, lots of organisms that live in the Arctic display or analogous structures. Uh, for example, the white fur of the Arctic fox or the white feathers of a snowbird or the appearance of the polar bear all provide for camouflage in the Arctic. And so again, form fits function. In animal body systems, you have four main types of tissues, or four types of tissues that we'll, we will look at today. And so epithelium, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue are these four categories. And epithelium is going to be really important for the lining of organs um, and for protecting surfaces like the skin, for example, or the lining of your esophagus, lining of your digestive tract. Connective tissue... Uh, can be subdivided into a variety of, of categories like blood and bone and um, cartilage and it just represents a type of tissue that's going to help support other body tissues. Fat is another example of that. Then you have some different types of muscle tissue and uh, you're probably most familiar with skeletal tissue if you're sitting upright in your chair or if you're fidgeting with a pencil you're using skeletal muscle to produce that movement. Um, nervous tissue of course is what we find in the nervous system so our brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And so it's going to be critically important for organisms to keep all of these body systems in balance and so the primary mechanism that animals use to do this is called negative feedback. And so we compare this to something like a thermostat. You have a set temperature in your home. I like to keep my home right around 74 degrees. If it gets a little bit too warm in the house, like sometimes people are coming in and out and so the temperature rises in the house, thermostat 
detects that and kicks the AC back on and so the temperature will start to cool down again. Conversely, if the house is getting too cold, then the thermostat detects that as well and it will stop turning on the AC unit. It might even, you might even have it set to start heating the home to bring you right back to the desired temperature. And so this is really similar to how thermoregulation works in, in animal body systems. And so if you're too hot, then service receptors in your skin will detect that and send the message to the hypothalamus in your brain, which will uh, initiate some reactions that cause you to sweat, to cause you to dilate your blood vessels, that allows for more heat to be exchanged with the bloodstream. Um, just the opposite, if you're too cold, skin service receptors will detect that, send the message to the hypothalamus again, but this time it's going to initiate uh, shivering with your skeletal muscles to help you generate heat and also it's going to constrict your blood vessels so that you can reduce the amount of heat that you're losing to your environment. So we divide these systems into two categories. They're either negative feedback or they're positive feedback. And negative feedback, as, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is more typical in animal systems. And so in a negative feedback system, the animal is going to respond to the stimulus in a way that reduces the stimulus. So if you're eating a delicious meal, your blood sugar levels rise, that stimulus is going to result in um, some activities happening at the level of the pancreas and at the level of the cell to reduce blood glucose levels. So more blood glucose uh, initiates a cascade of events to reduce blood glucose. So that's your negative feedback. So if you have more of a stimulus, it gets you less of the uh, stimulus. In positive feedback, you have a self-amplifying change. So the stimulus causes more and more and more of the response to take place. So a classic example of this is uh, labor and childbirth. You have the head of the baby pushing against the cervix and that push uh, initiates the brain to release hormones that are going to cause contractions, which then trigger more contractions and more and more and more until you have uh, the climatic event, which in this case is going to be the birth of a baby.